Welcome to episode two in the video series, Making Sense of the International Energy Conservation Code for Everyday Life. I'm Hope Medina with Colorado Code Consulting and I will be your host with a guest appearance from Gil Ross Miller. Today's episode is on the commercial building thermal envelope. So what is a building thermal envelope? For most people, it's the location of where the insulation is placed. But does it include more than just insulation? The definition states the basement walls, exterior walls, floors, ceiling, roofs, and any other building element assemblies that enclose conditioned space or provide a boundary between conditioned space and exempt or unconditioned space. It states boundary, which will include the insulation, of course, but it's going to also require air barriers, air sealing, and glazing to be included. Knowing where the building thermal envelope is located is so important that it is required by section C103.2.1 to be depicted on the plans. Most of the time the building's thermal envelope will be placed at the exterior walls and roof, but there are times that this depiction um, actually places questions in my mind. So let's take a look at the wall and roof sections. They show the insulation graphic that we've all become accustomed to as being associated as the building thermal envelope. But when you look at the floor plans and you see the labeling of rooms, it starts to make you question if the exterior wall is the correct location for the thermal envelope. For an example, there is a mechanical room that's located along that exterior wall. Is it inside or outside the thermal envelope? Is it bringing in outside air through ductwork for combustion air? Or maybe that storage room or the pool equipment room? Why do we need to know this? For the mechanical room, if outside air is brought in, then the room would be required to be outside the thermal envelope. Per section C402.5.3, it would be required to be located completely outside the thermal envelope or thermally isolated, meaning that the walls, floors, and ceilings are going to need to be insulated and to the values of the project. It's also going to require that the door be gasketed and not be louvered. All ductwork and water lines coming in and out of that room is going to be insulated. So as you can see, this could be a drastic change out in the field if it wasn't addressed before construction starts. This is why the code not only requires the thermal envelope to be depicted on the plans, uh, section C103.2 contains a list of items that must be detailed on the plans and four of those 12 items are thermal envelope components. Why is there such a different approach for commercial thermal envelopes than there is for residential. They both contain uh, prescriptive R value and U factor tables. Both require insulation, air barriers, and air sealing. The commercial provisions of the IECC does not have a roadmap to get you there like table R402.4.1.1 titled Air Barrier and Insulation Installation. Physics doesn't know if this building is a residential building or a commercial building. The insulation is still going to trap the stagnant air to resist heat flow. The air barriers and air sealing is still going to control the movement of air to assist the insulation with its job. And the glazing U factor and solar heat gain coefficient is still going to control the amount of heat in and out of the glazing. So why is there such a big different approach. Well, let's think about how these structures are built. Most houses or residential projects are built out of wood, possibly some mass walls. How are commercial projects built? There are so many factors that are involved with the material that can be used for a commercial project that really a prescriptive approach of a table uh, just is not practical. Let's think about it. Commercial projects can be constructed of wood, mass walls or mass floors, steel studs, metal buildings, or any combination of these. 
both tables C402.1.3 and C402.1.4 try to address this. Let's go ahead and take a look at C402.1.3, the prescriptive insulation R value table. Now the top line divides the table into the associated climate zones that you're going to find in chapter 3. And within the climate zones, it's broken into two columns. You have group R requirements, which is for projects that are in R occupancy, and then the category of all other, which are projects that um, have an occupancy other than an R occupancy. Below that, you have the row categories. You have uh, roofs, walls above grade, walls below grade, floors, slab on grade floors, and opaque doors. These row categories are further broken into uh, subcategories as to how these building components are constructed. For an example, let's take a look at the rows under roof. The first column gives you uh, the description of how the roof is constructed. We have uh, the row that is insulation entirely above roof deck, metal buildings, and attic and other. These are the three most common ways the roof is constructed. In climate zone five, if the insulation is located above the roof deck for a group R, it is required to have a minimum R30 continuous insulation. That's what the CI means. It means continuous insulation. But if this project was utilizing an attic, it would be an R38. So this is carried out for all of the components of the building. Now remember, a metal framed building is different than a metal building. A metal building will utilize metal as the skin of the building, the sheathing of the building. Whereas a metal framed is where the framing is made of metal, but the skin or sheathing is going to be made of a different material such as dense glass. Um, that's how you're going to determine which row the project is going to be utilized. Table C402.1.4 is set up the same way, but does utilize the whole assembly uh, U factor, C factor, F factor for these values and not just the insulation values. Both of these tables are showing you what the minimum R value or maximum U factor is and not how the insulation will be installed like in the residential provisions. For commercial projects, all you have is section C303.2, which states that the insulation must be installed per the manufacturer's installation instructions. Where these instructions often state that a grade one installation must be utilized. But most projects do not install the insulation correctly and would not meet this grade one installation. That insulation should never be crammed into a cavity. If the insulation doesn't fit, it should be cut to fit the cavity. When you compress the insulation, you diminish its ability to function properly. And when you don't function properly, you will not have the R value the project was designed with. Now this is going to affect more than just the thermal envelope performance. Remember, the mechanical systems and the equipment was designed and sized in accordance to the performance of this thermal envelope. By not installing the correct insulation R value or correct installation of the insulation, the mechanical systems may not be sized correctly and may not perform as they were designed to. So the next component of the thermal envelope that we need to address uh, is air leakage. C402.5 states you shall comply with the prescriptive air leakage components or you can test your building's thermal envelope. Uh, so that is basically like a big blower door test um, that you would need to do. Now you would never be able to pass this test if you weren't paying attention to and focusing on how to control the air movement within the building and that's the idea of it. Um, I've also seen where plans state this project is to comply with section C402.5 of the IECC. But how exactly is this done? There should not be just a note stating this project to comply with each of the following subsections of C402.5, 
the contractor should not be making these decisions out in the field. These components must be part of the building's design and the energy code acknowledges this. Section C 103.2 has a list of required items that must be detailed on the plans including air sealing which includes the items that we're going to discuss. So what exactly is in section C 405.2? Um, you know this section is titled air leakage. So we have things like air barriers and that includes the treatment of penetrations, air leakage of fenestration, uh, doors, access openings to shafts, chutes, stairwells, and elevator lobbies, air intake and exhaust openings, stairways and shafts, uh, loading dock weather seals, vestibules, and recessed lighting. So these are areas of air movement we need to pay attention to. Let's start with air barriers. How are air barriers defined? And so it's defined as one or more materials joined together in a continuous manner to restrict or prevent the passage of air through the building thermal envelope and its assemblies. Now it can be located on the interior, exterior, or a combination of the two. Now you have two options as far as the types of air barriers. You can utilize the materials approach or the assemblies approach. For the materials approach, materials with an air permeability that isn't greater than the 0 .004 CFM square foot under a pressure differential of 0 .03 inch uh, water gauge in accordance with the standard ASTM E2178. Now the code has a list of 16 materials in it that are already deemed to comply. Something I want to bring to your attention is that water resistive barriers are not on the list. Now keep in mind the intent of this material is to resist the penetration of water into your building assemblies and not necessarily restricting the movement of air. Now with that being said, there are some water resistive barriers out there that can be utilized for both of these aspects. But these materials have been tested to the ASTM E2178 and are shown to comply with the required air permeability. Now if this material is to be utilized for both requirements, then it must be installed per the manufacturer's installation instruction. Remember you need to ask for this information when you're reviewing the plans or when you're installing this material or when you're inspecting. Now for the assemblies approach the materials and components of the assembly must have an average air leakage not greater than 0 .004 CFM square foot under a pressure differential of 0 .03 inch water gauge in accordance with ASTM E2178. The code currently recognizes three assemblies that are deemed to comply. So what are the construction requirements these air barriers need to comply with? Well first off the air barriers must be continuous across joints and assemblies. And I have found that exterior walls of the building um, are thought about and addressed, but what about the roof or maybe that cantilevered floor? These components still are required to have an air barrier system and must be continuous with the exterior walls. So number two discusses the sealing of joints and seams. This will require sealing in transition locations and changes in materials. So those dissimilar materials, wood, to steel, what have you, those have to be addressed. Um, the sealing of the joints and seams must take into consideration that it doesn't dislodge and have the ability to resist positive and negative pressure from wind, stack effect, and mechanical ventilation. Now the third are penetrations of the air barrier. They must be caulked, gasketed, or sealed in a manner compatible with the construction materials and the location. That means you cannot just utilize caulk and sealant. They may not be compatible with this. Um, but similar to the joints and seams that you find in section 2, uh, the joints and seams of these penetrations must allow for the contraction 
um, and expansion and mechanical ventilation. They cannot dislodge or loosen or impair the penetration's ability to resist positive and negative pressure from wind, stack effect, and mechanical ventilation. One of the things that we need to talk about when uh, with penetrations is concealed fire sprinklers, right? So while these are very valued and needed penetrations, they still must comply with the air barrier construction. So these must be sealed in a manner that is recommended by the manufacturer. So you are not just to use some caulk or sealant to fill that void between the fire sprinkler cover plates um, and the wall or ceiling, depending on where they're located. They have to be done specifically as the manufacturer's installation instructions state. The fourth are recessed lighting fixtures. These are gonna need to be IC rated uh, they need to meet the air leakage rate, have a gasket, and be installed to maintain the integrity of the air barrier. We've talked about air barriers. What are some of the other areas of air leakage that really need to be addressed? Um, door and access openings to shafts, chutes, stairways, and elevator lobbies are going to be required to be sealed, uh, weather stripped, or gasketed very similar to what you would find with an attic access on the residential side. Uh, cargo and low door openings are required to be weather sealed to restrict air infiltration while the vehicles are parked in that doorway. Air intakes and exhaust openings, uh, stairways and shafts are required to be provided with a damper and those dampers may be required to be motorized. Last but not least are vestibules. Uh, building entrances are required to have a vestibule with self-closing doors and the interior door and exterior door should not be opened at the same time and revolving doors do not replace the requirement for a vestibule. But there are seven exceptions to this requirement including the use of an air curtain. So if an air curtain meets the requirements of velocity and are installed per the manufacturer's instructions, it will be required to have controls that only allow the operation of this air curtain with the opening of the door and then shut off when the door closes. Now, while you see here the example I have uh, doesn't meet the velocity, testing standard. It still had controls to it that only operated when the door was open and turned off when it shut. Now this was located in a city that didn't have uh, building codes and so anything kind of kind of went there. Another large piece of the building's thermal envelope are the fenestrations themselves. The IECC defines fenestrations as quote products classified as either skylights or vertical fenestration. Vertical fenestrations could be an opaque door, window, or glass block if the assembly is not less than 60 degrees from horizontal. If the assembly is less than 60 degrees, then it would be considered a skylight. So the next question is, when does an opaque door become a window? The IECC defines an opaque door as, quote, a door that is not less than 50% opaque in surface area. In other words, if a door is more than 50% glass, the door is considered a window and would need to meet all the window U-factor and solar heat gain coefficients found in Table C402.4. It is not unusual to see walls of glass in a new commercial building. Here we have a curtain wall assembly under construction without the glass installed. We have reviewed the importance of insulated walls, roofs, and air barrier installation in how the building performs. Now, how does the performance of the vertical fenestrations have on the overall building performance? You can think of the fenestrations as the weak link in the thermal envelope. An outstanding commercial window may have an R value of R3 to 4. Compare that to the walls of R20 and better. 
Just as important, and perhaps more important, than the window's U factor is the solar heat gain coefficient. Making certain commercial windows are code compliant is critical to overall building performance. Say a window assembly has a solar heat gain coefficient of 0.5. That means that 50% of the solar gains are reflected back outside. In many buildings, the solar heat gains are the largest load when sizing the air conditioning equipment. The label on the left, many of us recognize as the NFRC or the National Fenestration Rating Council label we have seen on most residential windows and indicates that the window is code compliant. The label on the right is one some of you may have seen on a commercial window. This does not indicate code compliance. Why is that you do not see the same label on commercial windows like residential windows? Well, unlike commercial windows, residential windows are mass produced with the same frame, same glass, same glass spacer. Once a residential unit is tested, the accredited factory can place the NFRC label on each window produced. Commercial windows have hundreds, if not thousands of different combinations of the frames, the glass types themselves, and the spacer between the glass that make up the entire window assembly. All three components must be evaluated as an assembly to verify conformance with the energy code. The NFRC has a CMA process, the Component Modeling Approach, along with your software tool, CMAST, uh, along with a very large directory of all the performance of each piece of the window assembly. The CMAST software tool then simulates the window's overall performance as a unit. This process starts when the supplier has ordered the windows for a specific project. That order is then analyzed by an NFRC accredited software engineer who then produces the CMA certificate. The certificate slash label would be available about the time the windows are being installed. Now, some of you may have realized that if the NFRC certificate is not available until the building is being constructed, what do we need at plan review? For plan review purposes, the designer must provide a compliance certificate or a pre-bid certificate from the frame supplier or CMAST engineer. This is the top half of a compliance certificate and shows us the glass type and the center of glass value in the lower left-hand corner and the expected overall U-factor in the upper right-hand corner. Yeah, we've got an older certificate here, so we're not seeing the solar heat gain coefficient uh, or a visible transmission. This was something before it uh, was required there in Climate Zone 5. This is the lower half of that same document, and it indicates the frame supplier uh, and the product itself. Uh, in the table, you'll locate the center of glass U value at a 0.29. Uh, and then the overall U factor, which is uh, going to be a 0 0.40. This is what we can use during plan review and for our HVAC load calculations. This is one page of the actual CMA certificate that indicates the U factor, solar heat gain coefficient, uh, visible transmittance used to determine code compliance. The other pages will indicate the supplier, the project details, the address of the project, uh, so that we can then verify that what we saw at plan review is actually what ended up on the job site. Many designers use ComCheck to show compliance with the energy code. This is just a partial page from a hotel, very large hotel, indicating the design, 2% better than code. We're good to go until we look at the window inputs. You'll notice here we've got windows, metal frame, uh, they've got a little over 2,500 square feet, but here's the biggie. They show the U value at the 0.29, which we now know is a typical center of glass value. So this is not the value they need to put in ComCheck. What we need to see here is the 0.40 or the overall 
U-value assembly. This is a very common mistake in COM checks and it's easy to pick up. Make sure you check. If a compliance certificate is not provided during plan review, then a default value must be assigned from table C303.1.3 paren 1 and is the value that would be used in COM check. As you can see in this table, the values are much, much not desirable and insulation values would have to go up in all other parts of the thermal envelope uh, to trade off uh, for these values. So I strongly encourage designers and, and plans examiners to uh, push for this compliance certificate and uh, the CMA certificate at the end, uh, or at least during when the uh, building is being built. So hopefully this provides a little guidance uh, toward uh, buildings fenestrations. We have discussed what the code states. Now let's take a look at it in everyday life. Let's take a look at these penetrations. We have some piping and some architectural features. Now both of these appear at first glance to be uh, sealed very nicely. We have the piping that has a quick flash type system. It's been sealed very nicely. The joints and seams are done. And then we have the architectural features which have done the same thing. But I want you to take a look at the left hand side there. We have three items that really need to be addressed. We have a pipe that's sticking out with no flashing system and no sealant. To the right of that, we have a red flashing system with no penetration coming through it. And then to the right of that, there's just an opening, which I'm not really sure. Not sure what's going on here. It looks like there was the piping that was going through that, that quick flash system, but may had to have been moved, but that new penetration has not been addressed as far as air sealing. There is no sealing around it. Uh, there's no flashing around it. And then we have the two openings that are gonna need to be addressed because you cannot have openings in your thermal envelope as far as your insulation values and for your air barrier. So those are gonna have to be treated on two fronts. Remember, your air barrier can be located on the interior side of the building, such as the pictures above. This project utilized the foil-backed poly-iso as their uh, air barrier. So those building elements that are penetrating it would be required to be sealed in a fashion that keeps the integrity of the air barrier. Next, we have this cantilevered floor. The floor itself was insulated to an R30 and then utilized the extruded polystyrene insulation board as its air barrier. And as you see, the joints and seams have been sealed. But notice there are two openings that have been cut into uh, this board. Those are going to be for some lighting features. Now at some point, once they've been installed, they are going to be required to be sealed so that we maintain this integrity of the air barrier. Here we have slab edge insulation for a project that's located in climate zone 4. The insulation has been placed on the outside of the building and the insulation has a value of an R10 and it happens to extend the required distance which for this case is 24 inches because the slab is not heated. Prescriptively, slab edge insulation is going to be required if your slab is located less than 24 inches below the finished grade. Now for your installation of slab edge, it should start at the top of the slab and extend downward for the minimum distance or to the top of the footing. Now one of the other options you could do is start from the top of the slab, extend down to the bottom of the slab, and then horizontally for the remainder of the distance. We have roof insulation that's located entirely above the roof deck. And as you can see, there are multiple layers of continuous insulation that is being installed. Unless there are manufacturer's installation instructions utilized, it's required per section C303.2.2 that the joints and seams must be staggered. I'd like to thank you for joining us today for episode two. We hope you found it educational.
We also hope that you follow us for future episodes in the video series, Making Sense of the International Energy Conservation Code for Everyday Life. Follow Colorado Code Consulting on Facebook at Colorado Code Consulting, LLC, our YouTube channel, Building Code Sense, and our website at www.coloradocode.net. The funding for this video was provided by Excel Energy.